Okay, I think, uh, I think we'll declare a quorum. We'll declare a quorum and begin uh, this last session. Several of the uh, participants have reminded me that uh, some of that my lecture, several participants have reminded me that uh, several of my lectures have uh, the same or nearly the same uh, titles. Uh, this particular lecture is called Macro Applications of Austrian Theory, and a subsequent lecture is called Extensions and Applications of Austrian Theory, uh, Macro Theory. And so uh, it was left to me to pick and choose just how to extend or what to apply and so on. And uh, one thing I've found it worthwhile to do, especially for uh, students who are actually studying economics and taking uh, the courses in macro taught by the mainstream or those of you who have, who have taken those courses, if only at an intermediate level, is to use uh, the theory that I developed uh, during my first lecture, what I call capital-based macro, or you could call it Austrian macro, Hayekian macro, uh, and use it uh, to get a truer reading of the alternative. And the alternative I have in mind for uh, this afternoon is Keynesian theory. Uh, and, and so my objective, as the first slide uh, hints about, is to put Hayek and Keynes head-to-head -head in a way that hasn't been done before, and in a way that, that exposes very clearly just what is being neglected by Keynes to give him the perverse results he gets, and just how to uh, morph from Keynesian theory to Hayekian theory to get the results that the Austrians get. And I think once you see that, uh, you get a better understanding of both theories. Okay, so we'll see, we'll have a go at it and see if it works that way. Uh, as just a preliminary, uh, let me suggest the, the need to put these two head to head. You, you would think it had been done before and had been done originally after all Hayek and Keynes knew one another. They were uh, both taught in England at the same time and both taught actually uh, at Cambridge and lived in Cambridge at the same time. This is when the London School of Economics moved to Cambridge uh, during the war. Keynes was actually helpful in finding Hayek living quarters there. And uh, they were friends. They were pretty good friends. And so you'd think that at some point or other, they, they did come to an agreement about what their disagreement was. But it isn't so. And uh, the reason it isn't so isn't too hard to discover when you read the literature. And I'll just give you a quick rundown. Um, Keynes wrote his earlier book, Treatise on Money, uh, in 1930. This is six years before he wrote the general theory. And the treatise on money, although very different from the general theory, uh, had a lot of the same problems that later cropped up in the general theory. Well, Hayek wrote a long, long review article uh, sorting out what he saw as the fallacies in uh, the treatise on money. He spent a good deal of time on it. Uh, and uh, thought he had done, well, the best he could, given what he had to work with uh, at the time. Published it within a year or so after the treatise came out. It was published in the journal edited by Keynes, so it was uh, uh, something that Keynes certainly paid attention to. But Keynes' response was that, oh, uh, I've changed my mind now. Anyway, way, I don't really agree with those ideas, and I'm currently working on a new set of ideas that I'll put forth in due time. And of course, that was going to be the, the general theory. Uh, and beyond that, rather than respond nonetheless to the criticisms that uh, Hayek had issued in that long review article, uh, he launched a frontal attack on Hayek's prices in production, a very vitriolic and uh, mean-spirited attack, uh, most people agree. Uh, and so that's where, that's where things stood. Uh, when Keynes then came around to publish his general theory in 1936, Hayek wasn't up to reviewing it. Uh, he didn't review it. it, it it's sort of a puzzle, uh, not only with uh, modern Austrians, but with Hayek himself. He, he asks himself the question, or used to ask himself the question, why didn't I review <laughs> the general theory? But, but, uh, and it's almost become a cottage industry uh, trying to answer that question in modern times, there are articles written in the history of political economy and other journals 
uh, addressing the issue, why didn't Hayek review the general theory? You know, it's hard enough to figure out why somebody did do something. <laughs> and it's very difficult to try to figure out why they didn't. And it's not that there aren't plenty of reasons. In fact, uh, in interviews and articles and uh, so on by Hayek, uh, he, he gives reasons, of five or six of them. And uh, no one's quite sure which one uh, really counts. But uh, one that I think is at least rhetorically effective is that uh, Hayek said, well, he saw what the result was when he reviewed Treatise on Money. Keynes had said he'd changed his mind now, no longer believes those things. And so Hayek wasn't prepared to spend that much time reviewing the general theory, only to expect Keynes uh, to say uh, the same thing, change his mind again. So uh, why bother? He didn't, uh, he didn't do it. Right? Uh, and you, you would think, looking back, you would think that if Hayek had had any idea how influential that second book was to become, uh, he might have gritted his teeth and reviewed the general theory. Uh, part of his reasons was that uh, he took his cue from Keynes, where Keynes uh, mentioned almost in, a, in passing in one of his articles that he didn't find it worthwhile just delving into alternative theories. He found it more productive to work on his own theory. And Hayek thought, well, okay, I'll take a case of that too, that, uh, that I, I should be developing the Austrian theory uh, and not spending my time criticizing somebody else's theory, which in any case he thought would be a flash in the pan uh, and uh, would fall out of favor uh, pretty quickly uh, for all of its uh, fallacies. So another reason not to do it, and in fact what he was working on at the time was that Long, long book, uh, published in 41, five years after the general theory, called The Pure Theory of Capital. Uh, and, and that wasn't uh, fundamentally addressed to the Keynesian issue at all, because it was a pure theory as opposed to a monetary theory. Uh, he intended to write a second volume later, uh, adding the monetary considerations, but uh, never did. Uh, and only in the waning pages uh, of uh, The Pure Theory of Capital did he turn to some of the Keynesian issues and offer something of a critique? But and it's worth reading. It, uh, worth reading. Look, uh, you know, tune in about about page 410 or something like that of Pure Theory of Capital and see what uh, Hayek has to say about Keynes. It's uh, it's fun to read and and it's basically right, I think. Uh, and and that's as far as it goes. No one ever read that because no one read the Pure Theory. That was that was his least successful book of all time, probably because it was devoted mainly to uh, capital theory. So my own exercise here is, is one that uh, starts almost with a clean slate, that no one really has put Keynes and Hayek head to head in the way that we'll be able to do uh, this afternoon. And what I intend to do, the basic structure is to start with Keynes, and I'm going to use his simplest model, what's called the Keynesian cross that was introduced by Samuelson, uh, it's simply the consumption equation. Many of you have seen it, worked with it, taken tests over it, or maybe given tests over it. <laughs> and, uh, and I hope you'll all be familiar with it, but if, if not, I can say a few things about it. So we'll start with Keynes in the simplest form and see what we have to do eventually to morph into a Hayekian story. And uh, in my own defense, I'll say that uh, even though I'm starting with the most basic theory, the, the Keynesian cross, uh, we get the same results if we start with the ad advanced theories. In other words, if I, if I use what's called ISLM analysis, uh, which many of you are familiar with, is taught sometimes at the intermediate level, or even use uh, what has become fairly per pervasive in the literature, uh, aggregate supply, aggregate demand analysis, uh, you still get the same results. It just takes the edge off the conclusions, but but the, the, the uh, directions of movements in the variables are all uh, still the same. So better to start with the simple theory. It cuts, or it cuts to the chase and shows you what the relationship is between the two theories. So <clears throat> I'm going to start with a graph that caused many of you to leave economics <laughs> when you majored in it in high school or in, uh, as an undergraduate. And what you can see, I'm, I'm plotting uh, income on the horizontal axis. Income in macro is symbolized by Y. That's not because 
economists can't spell, although many of them can't. Uh, but little i means interest and capital I means investment, so its income is y. Consumption measured on the uh, vertical axis, I'll put a 45 degree line in there so you, just to get your orientation. And you can tell me uh, how consumption varies with income. Well, the more you earn, the more you consume. I mean, who would doubt it? Uh, it has to be true. Uh, everybody thinks it's true, not just Keynes. Okay, what's unique about Keynes is it becomes the cornerstone of his whole theory. And it's a short-run theory, which means that he allows for some consumption even at a zero income. You're consuming from past saving, so that, could, that might be pretty short-lived. But uh, it just illustrates that it's a short-run theory. And I've written it here uh, with an intercept of 200. That's a macro magnitude, so 200 billion, okay? And uh, a slope of uh, two-thirds. That's, that two-thirds is what's called marginal propensity to consume. You've read it all in Samuelson. You know how that works. And that's the way it looks. Uh, the general form of the equation is C equals A plus B Y. A is the 200, that's the vertical intercept. B is the slope, that's the two-thirds Ameri Americanizing here. Americans don't like to say marginal propensity to consume. They, they just rather say B, <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's simpler. And actually, the way I've got it uh, written up there <clears throat> is just a little bit misleading, but it's the way you always see it in the text. Sometimes when I write it, I write it as C equals A plus B Y, period. And, and the period probably is the more important aspect of the consumption function. It means that consumption depends on income and nothing else. It depends on nothing else, just income. You tell me your income, and uh, we'll tell you uh, your consumption level. Not for the individual, but for the economy as a whole. All right? So and what it doesn't depend on, uh, importantly, in, in our discussion here, is the interest rate. In other words, wouldn't a high interest rate cause people maybe to consume a little less now and put some savings at interest? Or wouldn't a low interest rate cause people not to care about saving and to consume more than they otherwise would? Uh, if that were true, then what would happen is that curve would shift up or shift down with changes in the interest rate. But in Keynes, it doesn't. He's very adamant about that. It doesn't shift. A and B are parametric. They don't change. They are what they are. It's not like Avogadro's number, but for a, diff for a given country at a given time, A and B are what they are. The curve doesn't shift, and certainly not with changes in the interest rate. You might be able to see that more clearly, or see the significance more clearly, if you realize that saving in Keynes is simply what's left out of income after you've done your consumption. So savings, too, depends only on current income and not on the interest rate. Savings does not depend on the interest rate uh, in the Keynesian construction. That's a huge difference between Keynes uh, and Hayek, all right? Um, the particular equation there would be C equals 200 plus <laughs> two-thirds Y, okay? Now, that's the same thing. I've just squunched it up there at the top so I can draw some more stuff underneath it. Uh, and I'm going to let this... Uh, consumption equation represent consumption in a wholly private economy. In other words, there's no public sector. There's no government. It's, uh, it's wholly private. So all the spending there is is consumption spending and investment spending. C plus I, not C plus I plus G. G is out. G is zero. Right? So just C plus I. Uh, and then we learn uh, when we take our Keynesian theory that the economy will settle into an equilibrium when income equal expenditures. And of course, you've seen, it's almost a sing-song fashion, Y equals C plus I plus G, just C plus I uh, in this diagram. And for starters, I'm even going to let uh, investment equal zero. And so uh, the economy settles into an equilibrium where income equal expenditures, the circular flow, with uh, consumption being the total of all income. People earn money, they spend it all. Okay? Uh, so the intersection of the consumption equation and the 45 degree line represents an income expenditure equilibrium. So you have expenditures on the 
vertical axis, which are just consumption expenditures right now. Uh, and uh, so at that 45 degree line, income equal expenditures, income equal to consumption, because we're setting investment uh, equal to zero. Okay, so let's let investment be zero initially, and then increase it in increments of say 200, keeping track of the relationship between consumption and investment. Let me show you this. Uh, there's investment equals zero, and the little black dot shows the income expenditure equilibrium. Now what I want to do, I need a different, I need another diagram. I'll stick over here on the right. There it is. And I'm going to do something that the Keynesians don't do, and that is to show you the relationship between investment spending and consumption spending. And I do that by putting investment I on one axis, the horizontal axis, and consumption on the vertical axis, okay? You don't see that in Keynesian theory because in Keynesian theory, consumption and investment are just two different kinds of spending. And for Keynes, spending is spending. Add it all up, C plus I, not C against I, all right? But here we're keeping track of them separately. How does one vary with the other, right? Well, I think you can see how it works. Uh, see if I, I don't need a keyboard. Uh, if you look at that little black dot on the left, that shows you the level of consumption spending, the vertical distance, but there's no investment spending, so just trace over to the right where you hit the C axis, and that would represent a point of consumption and investment. Let me show you. Like that, that black dot on the right shows the amount of consumption, the vertical distance, at zero investment. All right? Now what we'll do is just add investment to the left and see what that does to, con to the relationship between investment and consumption. And I'll remind you here, uh, this is very true to Keynes, I've already said that in, in the Keynesian framework, savings does not depend on income. Okay? And in the Keynesian framework, investment doesn't depend on anything except psychological factors, waves of optimism and pessimism. Uh, Keynes used the colorful term animal spirits. I can see somebody mouthing animal spirits. Say, I'm not making this up. You've read the book, okay? Uh, three times in the span of a page and a half, uh, Keynes uh, emphasizes the almost total dependence of investment decisions on fire in the belly, uh, level of confidence, level of optimism, animal spirits is a psychological phenomenon. And it doesn't depend on the interest rate, okay? Saving doesn't depend on the interest rate. Investment doesn't depend on the interest rate. And yet somehow those two magnitudes have to come together uh, to give us an, an equilibrium. So in, in this little construction, I'm entitled to add some investment spending based on, well, a higher level of optimism, more fire in the belly, uh, waxing of the animal spirits, as Keynes would say, all right? So if you add investment, and you notice there we're adding C and I on the Keynesian graph, because that's the way he did it. Uh, total expenditures, C plus I. And uh, you can see a new equilibrium. It's the black dot. See, the old dot is turned hollow. It's no longer an equilibrium. So the black dot now is the new equilibrium. And what I want to do is trace over to the right to see how income relates to consumption. First I have to trace down to get the consumption, then trace to the right, uh, and it looks like this. You see how that works? In other words, on the horizontal <coughs> axis on your right panel, uh, I've got when investment is 200, then consumption is 1,000. All right? Now, let's do it again. I'll add investment another 200. You know, suppose, suppose that uh, investors become even more optimistic. That gives me a new equilibrium. And again, I can trace down to consumption and over to investment equals 400. And I get another point on that relationship between consumption and investment. Uh, and this is something I can keep doing. And if I, if I didn't run out of space, I could just keep doing it uh, indefinitely. Uh, we'll do a, another one or so. You get the idea. You get what that relationship looks like. Okay, we got room to do one more.
I suppose so. There it is. Okay. Now, if you remember your analytic geometry, six points is enough to determine a straight line. <laughs> With about four left over, fortunately they're all lined up. <laughs> and uh, the straight line looks something like that. Right? And that straight line becomes very significant uh, for the Austrians and for Keynes, for that matter, as, uh, as, as I'll show you. Um, if, uh, if you remember, how many, how many have taken or even taught uh, an undergraduate principles course in macro? We've got quite a few that have done that. Okay, so, uh, and, and uh, I think the rest of you can see this easily enough. Uh, that what normally gets done is you start with these two simple equations. One shows the consumption equation, C equals 200 plus 2 thirds Y. And the other is a statement of the equilibrium condition the economy settles into an income expenditure equilibrium when income equals expenditures, when y equals c plus i. And, and on the first exam that you take in that course, the professor challenges you to actually calculate an equilibrium income given a, given b, and given the level of investment. Okay? So you solve for y. Okay, you can do it. Uh, some of my Auburn students can do it. <laughs> Uh, you can solve for the equilibrium level of income. Fine. But I want to do something different. What I want to solve for is the relationship between consumption and investment. So what I want to do is eliminate the y from that equation, from those equations, and, and get consumption as a function of investment. Uh, you could do it yourself, uh, but uh, it looks something like that. All I did is substitute in c plus i for y and simplify, and you finally get an equation that looks like C equals 600 plus 2 times I. All right? Uh, and that's the equation of that line, 600 plus 2 times I. And if you want to do it in general terms and, and using the A's and B's, it looks like this. C equals A over 1 minus B. 1 minus B is the marginal propensity to save, isn't it? Plus B over 1 minus B times I. So B might be, well, in this, in this particular uh, example, B is two-thirds, isn't it? It's a slope. So two-thirds divided by one minus two-thirds, well, one minus two-thirds is a third, and two-thirds divided by one-third is two, okay? So uh, it, it shows that uh, for every dollar that investment goes up, consumption goes up by two dollars, okay? And the key thing here is that it, it shows that investment and consumption move in the same direction. Okay? They're not alternatives. They don't move against one another. You don't give up one to get more of the other. But rather, by construction, they always have to move in the same direction. And again, I'll remind you that if I set this up using ISLM analysis or aggregate supply, aggregate demand, the same would be true. Uh, only in the most extreme and un-Keynesian specifications of the parameters could you get them to move opposite one another. Okay? They always move up and down together. Now, that's a very simple equation. It was derived very simple, simply. It comes from the basic uh, income expenditure analysis. And yet, and yet, I'll challenge any of you, all of you, to find that equation in any macro book, any principles book, at any level, principles, intermediate, graduate, you will not find it, except in my book and uh, books that have chapters contributed by me, okay? Uh, it's not there. Nobody recognizes it. Keynes, I'll show you in a minute, Keynes recognized this, but uh, it's not generally recognized. Now, I was aware of this while I was writing Time and Money, that this is not in any book that I know or that any of my colleagues know about. And so I imagined myself to be the first one to put that equation, it's an important equation, but a simple one, in print, in a book. And I thought that, you know, I would achieve at least that. Well, I failed. I failed. And it's not that somebody beat me to the punch, but when Routledge sent me the first copies of the first press run of Time and Money, I turned to page 136 where that equation was to appear. There was a blank space about like that. It says... See the following equation, it was totally blank. It wasn't there. 
I didn't achieve my goal, okay? <laughs> when I visit libraries, I pull it off the shelf and write it in, okay? <laughs> but got a few libraries to go. And fortunately, it got into the second, uh, uh, second printing. I've had emails. People ask me, what's supposed to go into the blank spot, you know? What, what is it? Okay. It's this critical equation. Now, let, let me show you that uh, Keynes himself recognized the essence of this equation, only he simplified it in even further. He says, let's let A, which is just that intercept, at least for the purposes of argument, let's let it be zero. So you just get C equals B over 1 minus B times I. All right. And I think of, uh, let's see, uh, here's, here's this, uh, directly from Keynes. And uh, first, this is uh, my wording. For simplicity, let A equals zero and B equals 0.9. And I'm aligning with Keynes's own numbers. Then the equation becomes C equal 0.9y. If you plug it in, you just get you get C equals 9i. All right. So here's what Keynes actually wrote. He says, and he wrote this in a 1937 article, a year after the book came out. Uh, and the article was uh, just called the General Theory of employment, and he, he took it on himself to explain what he thought the significance of his book actually was. Uh, so he says, if, for example, the public are in the habit of spending nine-tenths of their income on consumption goods, okay, B equal 0.9, it follows that if entrepreneurs were to produce consumption goods at a cost more than nine times the cost of investment goods they are producing, some part of their output could not be sold at a price which covered the cost of production. So you see where he gets a nine times, that's the nine I. Okay, he goes on, he says, this formula is not, of course, quite so simple as in this illustration. Well, no, it's not because he made the A zero. I've let it be some uh, number. He says, but there's always a formula more or less of this kind relating the output of consumption goods which it pays to produce to the output of investment goods. So he's saying there's always a formula that shows how those two things go up and down together, and that this conclusion appears to me to be quite beyond dispute. In other words, it's beyond dispute that there's no trade-off between investment and consumption. How can that be? It seems like to me it would be beyond dispute than that in an economy facing constraints of scarcity, you couldn't do more of one thing without doing less of the other. It's beyond dispute that they have to move against one another, not with one another. Yet the consequences which follow from it are at the same time unfamiliar and are of the greatest possible importance. So that's Keynes recognizing that the, the significance of that upward sloping line uh, is tremendous. It plays a big role in the general theory. Okay? Now, one thing I'll call to your attention is there's nothing really that tells us when to stop with this little experiment except I run out of graph. All right? And yet, you'd think that surely you have to stop when you hit full employment because you can't keep producing more and more, at least on a sustainable basis, after full employment. And yet there's no hint up there where full employment is. It's not part of the graph. You have to know where it is and stick it into the graph. Now, in the Austrian view, we mark full employment by that production possibilities frontier. So let's just slap that on there and see if we might be at full employment. We might be not quite there yet, or we might be beyond it. Who knows? Because I didn't have that guidance. And I'll stick it on there. C and I are positively related. There's no trading off of one against the other. Okay? Then I ask, is this last point below at or above full employment? You don't, you don't know. You have to wait till I put the PPF up there. There, there it is. Okay? There's the PPF. So you can see we've pushed beyond full employment. Well, let's back it up a little bit and at least start with an economy that's at full employment. Okay. Now, Keynes would show full employment as a labor market that clears at the going wage rate. See, Keynes didn't draw the PPF either. Do you have a quick question? Yeah, I just threw it in there. Okay. I was hiding that little piece of information until I could spring it on you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I didn't derive it from what's already up there. I just stuck it on there. Uh, Keynesians would show full employment as the labor market clears of the going wage. See that uh, Keynes took the wage rate as given. It is what it is, 
and he took the supply of labor as given. And so his question is, does the demand for labor intersect at a level that clears that market? All right? And, and the only way you can determine that, see, we've got income over here. And uh, it looks like that income is at about 3,000. So you look at, at 3,000 and say, well, at that level of income, is the labor market clearing? What do you think? Is it clearing? Can you tell? What are you looking at? Well, the only way to tell is, is, is take a look at the labor market at that point. Just pull down a little spotlight there that has the labor market. You say, yeah, it's clearing. It's clearing. That's full employment. Uh, what's fixed there is the wage rate and the supply curve for labor. But the demand for labor, given the uh, current level of output, is just high enough to clear that market. If it had been lower, we'd have unemployment. If it had been higher, we'd have inflation. Okay, but it's just right, as, as it happens to be. And Keynes says it's only by happen so that that's right. You should be so lucky that it clears. And even if it does, your luck will run out because there could be a waning of animal spirits and investment might fall. Okay? Now, we can even include the loanable funds market uh, in spite of the fact that Keynes himself uh, threw that graph out of his book. He didn't have any loanable funds market. Uh, and, and we can even show it in the classical sense. The supply slopes upward, demand slopes downward. And I can use this diagram to show you why Keynes got rid of the loanable funds market. Uh, when I drew the consumption equation, I indicated that, according to Keynes, neither saving nor investment depended on the interest rate. And that's what Keynes thought, but he was willing to argue the case where it does, all right, as in, as in the loanable funds market. And uh, it was on this issue that caused Axel Leyenhoofed, if any of you have read his stuff, he's got great stuff, to claim that Keynes argued like a lawyer against paying any attention to the loanable funds market. I don't know if I want to explain this or not, because I think we probably have some lawyers in here, okay? <laughs> but you, you don't have to admit it, okay? Uh, and, and I wonder if you know what it means to argue like a lawyer. Uh, a, a lawyer would argue, my client didn't borrow your lawnmower. And it was already broken when you lent it to him. <laughs> And it was still in perfect shape when he returned it. <laughs> okay. The idea is that if you get the jury to go for any one of those claims, you got your client off the hook. Okay. So Keynes was willing to make almost any assumption about this market as long as he could figure out how to, how to be dismissive of it, the loanable funds market. Um, okay. Now, Keynes himself uh, thought in terms of just that one diagram, uh, the consumption equation. So when Samuelson created the Keynesian cross, that, that consumption equation crossing the 45 degree line, it's called the Keynesian cross, invented by Paul Samuelson. Uh, Keynes didn't have any graphs in his book except for one. We'll show it to you. Uh, but when Samuelson in, invented the Keynesian cross, he, he cut to the chase. He got, he got right at Keynes. That's what Keynes had in mind. And Keynes could, could uh, explain his whole argument just in terms of that diagram. And all the other modifications were just qualifications to, that uh, took the edge off of the results a little but didn't change the essence of it. So let's go with Keynes, at least for starters, and let's eliminate, uh, let's eliminate loanable funds market and even the PPF. Okay? And let's put this thing through its paces. I'll show you the market uh, for labor because he did pay attention to that. Although, as you can see, that has to be added on. That doesn't just uh, fall out of the Keynesian cross. Did you have a quick question? Another natural assumption that we're in employment? Uh, it, it's not. That's a good question. Uh, it turns out we are, but according to Keynes, only by dumb luck. Okay? We are only by dumb luck. In fact, as we'll see later, maybe I should mention it now, uh, Keynes criticized Hayek for assuming you're at full employment. Okay? And Keynes thought the general case is that you're not. But in this, in this illustration, I'm showing that even if you are, if only by dumb luck, you probably won't stay there. Okay, that's the idea. Uh, 
So that's why the investment fall because of a waning of animal spirits, and that's why investment falls. That uh, that uh, investors uh, become introspective about the house of cards that we call a market economy, and they get cold feet, and, and they lose the fire in the belly, and they start pulling back. And when some pull back, they all pull back. It's a contagious thing. Okay, that's the way. They, I mean, investment just falls. Uh, can go the other way, but it's more likely to fall. All right. Uh, one analogy that Keynes used, or at least so I'm told, I haven't found this in the literature. If anybody can find it for me, I'll be uh, grateful. Uh, according to the story, uh, Keynes was waiting in the lobby of a fish food uh, of a fish food restaurant, seafood restaurant. While he was waiting for his table, he was watching the aquarium. I always thought Red Lobster invented that, you know, but I guess. In the 30s, they had aquariums in their seafood restaurants. And watching the fish in the big tank, and, and, and the fish would all swim together. And way before they got to the other end of the tank, they would turn all at once and swim the other way. And Keynes looked at it and he said, that's, that's just like investors. That's just like the business community. They're optimistic, and then all of a sudden, all of them turn. They're pessimistic. And who knows why and how do they all know to turn at the same time? That's just the way they are. That's the way the fish are. That's the way the investors are. Right? That was his vision of what uh, the investment community looks like. Okay? So let investment fall. Uh, and you can see how that, see where C plus I became C plus I prime, that shifts down just a little bit. Okay? And I say, what happens? And I'll give you a hint to, to make points on the quiz if we, if we gave a quiz over this that it's a pretty good assumption, works in almost all cases, that in, in Keynesian theory, if anything happens, the economy crashes. Okay? <laughs> and the only exception to that is that it's possible that it goes into an inflationary spiral. Okay? But usually it crashes. And it follows trivially from the fact that, look, the interest rate's out of play, the uh, wage rate is fixed, uh, and if you happen to be in full employment at that wage rate, if market conditions change so that the labor market doesn't clear at that wage rate, it's going to be in trouble because the wage rate doesn't change and the, and the economy simply spirals into uh, depression. So what happens? Watch, uh, and, and you can see if you've taken uh, that principles course or even taught it, you can see what's going to happen. We'll make it crash. It crashed, okay? So the economy spiraled downwards, moving along that 45-degree line, until once again income equal expenditures. The wage rate didn't change, it's the going wage. In, in Keynesian theory, the going wage keeps going even after the market conditions that gave rise to it are gone. All right? That's Keynesian theory. He called it a general theory. Okay? And you can see in the uh, spotlight there that we've got unemployment, that's cyclical unemployment, you're in a depression. Uh, the wage rate hasn't changed, uh, and you can see that both uh, investment and consumption have fallen. It was a fall in investment that caused the fall in income, which caused the fall in consumption. Another way to get points on the test is to realize that in Keynesian theory, everything always moves in the same direction. Income, expend expenditures, investment, saving, it all moves down, it all moves up, okay, up and down together. Different rates, maybe, but up and down Together. There's never any give and take, never any trade-off between the two, okay? The economy crashes. We get it, okay? Now, where I put the circle there, I'm showing you that's, that's the decrease in investment. And I'm now just trying to line it up with what you've learned in college. Uh, and that horizontal distance is the change in income. And the relationship between that small change in investment in the large change in income, that's the Keynesian multiplier, 1 over 1 minus b, okay? So the economy spirals down in, in many rounds, multiple rounds, until investment has fallen by a large amount compared to the fall in investment. In fact, 1 over 1 minus b times the change in investment, okay? Now, what I want to do is I want to do that same thing again, but this time... I'm going to include uh, the production possibilities frontier. Tell the same story, but now you've seen what goes on on the left side. 
So you don't have to watch it. The same thing's going to go on on the left side. So you want to watch the production possibilities. Front. What do you think is going to happen? Uh, watch the waning and the crash again this time with an eye on the PPF diagram. Okay? So investment falls. There it fell. You see that on the left side. Now watch the right side. Watch the crash. Okay? It moves inside the PPF, and it moves down along that very line that we derive from those two basic equations. Okay? That's, that's the only way the economy can move, is up and down along that line. Can't possibly move along the frontier. And that line doesn't change, except in very unusual circumstances. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, that's the way it looks. Okay? Now, I want to do it still another time, and this time I want to do it again, but carry the loanable funds market. And this will help you see why Keynes threw out, threw out the loanable funds market. Uh, again, uh, with the loanable funds market in play, a decrease in investment shows up in two ways. Well, yeah, shows up as, as a shift downward of C plus I, but also it shows as a shift leftward of the demand for loanable funds, doesn't it? Because investors aren't borrowing as much anymore to undertake their investments, because they're not t undertaking that much investment. So there is the decrease in investment. They're not borrowing as much as before. They're not investing as much. What are the effects? If you look at the loanable funds market, you say, oh, 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 I see the effects. The effects is for the interest rate to fall. And that would, uh, that would lessen the amount that... Uh, in quantity invested actually fell, and it would stimulate consumption because at lower interest rates, people aren't interested in saving as much, and they would spend on consumption goods. That's what would happen. That's supply and demand. That's, that's the loanable funds theory. Right? And Keynes says, no, 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 that doesn't happen. None of that happens because before that gets a chance to happen, something else happens. And what would that be? In the Keynesian theory, when anything happens, the economy crashes, okay? And when the economy crashes, I want to see if you're paying attention now. When the economy crashes, incomes go down, consumption goes down, and what does saving do? It goes down. Everything goes down together, okay? So when I pull the trigger now, okay, now watch the crash which entails a decrease in income and hence a decrease in saving. Watch it crash. Okay. So uh, you see the same thing went on in those first two diagrams, and now we're showing what goes on in the loanable funds. This is the reason why Keynes threw out the loanable funds market. He said, well, when all is said and done, the interest rate is just what it was before. So why do we say that the interest rate depends on the supply and demand for loanable funds when both those curves shift at once? When they both shift at once, it doesn't change the interest rate. So what does determine the interest rate? He treats that late in the general theory. And early in the general theory, he just says, the interest rate is determined by forces of a different kind. <laughs> say, oh, what kind? <laughs> and of course, when you get there, you find out it's liquidity preference and, and all that, okay? which I've left out of this story. Okay? Now, here's what's, here's what's uh, reassuring to me about this, this whole exercise. Look at that uh, loanable funds market. Both curves shift. The interest rate uh, stayed the same. And it turns out, uh, as I said a minute ago, uh, Keynes didn't have any graphics in the general theory. You, you flip through the general you find no graphics except one. He didn't even have the Keynesian cross. That was Samuelson. Okay. But what was the one? The one was this diagram. And it was this diagram used to make this point. Right? And it was put in there belatedly at the suggestion of Roy Herod, who was one of the few people that read the general theory uh, to give him feedback you know, from a, uh, a colleague uh, before it went to, to press. And, and essentially, uh, Herod talked to Keynes about this, and he says, he, he told Keynes, or he asked Keynes, he says, uh, at that point, there's no, no diagrams in the general theory. And he says, Keynes, are you saying, are you throwing out the loanable funds market? And Keynes says, yeah, I'm throwing it out. And Herod said, well, 
If that's what you're doing, you better alert your readers because they're not going to believe it. You better, you better indicate specifically you're throwing it out and give some reason why you're throwing it out. So Keynes took him up on it. And he put it in, threw it out. <laughs> okay. Now, what I did here, let me, let's see, I hope this is, uh, yeah, this is page 180 of the general theory. And he even says, you can, I don't know if you can read the footnote, but he said this figure was, uh, what does it say, oh, suggested by Mr. Roy F. Herod, R. F. Herod, okay. Um, and the figure is a little bit convoluted. You can't quite see that it's the same thing. It is the same thing. But uh, there's a, a, a sinful thing here that Keynes has done. You see how he labeled the vertical axis? <laughs> That's a no-no. <laughs> if you draw a graph, label the axis. Uh, if, you, if you read the text, you, you understand that it's saving and saving comma investment. So he's, it's a loanable funds market. And, and therefore, he's got saving investment vertical instead of horizontal. He's got the interest rate, which he calls R horizontal instead of vertical, right? So if you want to compare that diagram to my own, uh, you have to sort of flip it over and rotate it, which I've done for you. Let me bring it out here like that, okay? And then let's label the axes. Oh, I'm sorry. What? Let me go back to there. Uh, look at the graphs first. He's got a bunch of them. But the ones he focuses on are the ones where the interest rate doesn't change. And so uh, let me eliminate the ones, the other ones. I just knocked out some. And now you can see he just got a, two supplies and two demands, and they shift, and the interest rate doesn't change. Okay? Now I can't stand it. I've got to label the axis. <laughs> it's saving an investment. <laughs> now, if you read this page, I'll invite you to read it. Actually, I have to read page 181, too. I haven't got it up here. But pick up the general theory. I started to say, I, I imagine it's here in the Mises Institute Library, but maybe it's not. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. But here, here was Keynes' point. He put this in here. And he says, and, and Keynes says, look, uh, there's an equilibrium with the supply and demand for loanable funds. Says, you want to you try to analyze what's going on with the loanable funds market? He says, it won't work because suppose investment falls like that. He says, okay, investment falls, income falls. If income falls, savings falls. Well, let's show savings falling. There it is. Where's your new equilibrium? Psst. It doesn't change the interest rate. This diagram doesn't help us a bit. We threw it out. All right? Now, to me, that's very telling. I mean, that, that shows that our putting Hayek head-to-head -head with Keynes here is, is going to work because, because this is exactly what Keynes' point was with the one and only one diagram in the whole book. You'll never see that diagram in a principles text like that. You'll never see it uh, in an intermediate test. At the graduate level, they don't pay any attention to it. No one ever pays any attention to the significance of that graph in the general theory. Okay? Oh, something's crashing again. Okay. So uh, there's uh, the comparison. If you look at loanable funds there, it's the same thing. I've cleaned up the diagram, of course, relative to what Keynes drew. Now, let me take this one step further that gives us the tie-in with uh, Hayek. Um, Keynes had a par what he called the paradox of thrift. And we can illustrate that by allowing saving to increase. Uh, Keynes really didn't think this was a big problem simply because saving doesn't increase. He says saving is what it is given the income. The saving function doesn't change. The consumption function doesn't change. But suppose they do, Maynard. Well, he's there to say, well, it's a good thing they don't change, because if they did, you know what would happen to the economy? <laughs> It'd crash. <laughs> okay. So, he, and he got this very explicitly in the, in the uh, general theory, where he says, well, it's a good thing saving doesn't uh, just increase, but if it did, it would cause the economy to crash, and let's see how. Uh, now, how do we show saving increasing? Well, you show it by showing consumption decreasing, okay? If people just all of a sudden decide to consume less, that whole C curve will just shift down. And, of course, C plus I will shift down, too, not because I changes, but because I is sitting on top of C, yeah. Are people just out and out saving more, or is the same? Um, it's the A term that changes. In other words, saving equals minus A plus 1 over 1 minus B times, or times 1 minus B times Y. It's the A term that changes. Okay, 
So the intercept term is what changes. You could, I could do this and let the slope change, but I'm just letting the whole curve shift down. That would be a particular way in which people could increase their saving, all right? And I'd have to show that in two ways, uh, because I've got saving there in the loanable funds market, so that saving is going to shift to the left, okay? So let's let consumption fall. That means there's an increase in saving. I said shift to the left, it goes to the right. So saving goes to the right, more <coughs> saving for each and every interest rate. And so I ask what would happen if you have your Hayek hat on, you say, oh, I see what would happen. The interest rate would be driven down. That would inspire investors to invest more. Okay, the economy would grow faster. All right. And, and uh, if, you know, you've got consumption going down and investment going up. That's very high acting. But in Keynes, that never happens. And Keynes says, no, no, it doesn't give, get a chance to happen because something else happens first. And you know what it is, the economy crashes. So what it, <laughs> you're getting it, okay, you're going to pass the test, okay. And so, and so what he's saying here is that, look, uh, look on the CNI graph, you see expenditures have fallen because people are saving more. So the economy spirals down, and when it spirals down, <laughs> incomes fall, and when incomes fall, saving falls. Even though, it, even though it shifted right, that's what set off the sequence, it shifts back with a fall in income. It's as if, well, more than as if, you're trying to change the saving to income ratio by increasing saving. But in trying to increase saving, all you do is lower income. And yeah, you're saving more out of your income because it's a smaller income. All right? That's what happens. Now, the only other adjustment I need to make, let's see if I say something about it, Note that the, it's the A in the C equals A plus BY that decreased. But we also note that that A shows up in that, uh, what I call the Keynesian demand constraint, that upward sloping curve that cuts the PPF. Uh, so that thing's going to shift down too. Uh, normally it doesn't change because A and B don't change. But here A has changed, and so it's going to shift <coughs> down. So let's pull the trigger and watch it crash. All right? So, see, savings shifted back because of the income effect. It shifted out because of the increase in saving preferences and then shifted back because that sent the economy into depression. The economy still ends up inside the PPF. It's in recession. And the uh, left diagram shows that you're at an income expenditure equilibrium with unemployment. Okay, that's pure Keynes. Right? Now, so income falls and with it saving, undo, undoing the initial increase in saving. Hence the paradox. In, in trying to save more, the result is that you all earn less out of which to save. That's the paradox. All right? uh, here's Keynes. I, I think I had this on the board in a different context in an earlier lecture. Every attempt to save more by reducing consumption will so affect incomes that the attempt necessarily defeats itself. That's what Keynes says. All right? And that's what we've shown on our graphics and show just how. Okay. Now, to resolve the paradox, let's outfit the model with a Hayekian triangle and corresponding labor markets, plural. All right. Let me call your attention to the, little, the vertical line. It's not filled in. It's just that you can see it. That shows how much consumption is at full employment. See, we're back at full employment now, miraculously. Okay. So that vertical line at full em that measures consumption that's the ultimate output of the Hayekian triangle. Okay? So watch when I make this substitution. I'll do it twice. There's, there's one. Now see that, see that consumption there as that vertical side of the right triangle? Keep your eye on that consumption. Let me just go back. You see that's, still, that's consumption there. So all I'm doing is changing horses here and taking out canes and putting in Hayek. All right? Uh, and the, the other uh, change I'll make is I'll put in two labor markets, one representing early stage and one late stage, so we can get some dynamics, some, some relative movements between them. Right? And what I want to do with it is two things. One is I want to let saving increase just like I did before, and, and even let the economy crash just like Keynes said it would. And I'll just track it. I'll show what it looks like in a Hayekian framework. Okay, let's show the paradox again, this time keeping track of it with capital-based graphics. Right? So there's the increase in saving. Now watch it crash. 
All right? So you can see, uh, look on the triangle, you can see the whole triangle got smaller, which is consistent with Keynes' assumption we have a fixed structure of industry. It's just a question of at what level of utilization uh, is operating. And you see that the wage rate didn't change and demand for labor decreased in early stages and late stages. It all just worked, everything went down together. Okay? And finally, set it up again, let the saving, let's do it again, let's let saving increase, and finally, finally, I'm going to let investment consumption move opposite one another, I'm going to let labor move out of late stages into early stages, and let the interest rate change, let the market work, okay, you get a movement along the PPF, uh, no depression, no unemployment because the wage rate adjusted and so on. So Hayek's whole theory is based on the idea that markets work, okay? And Keynes' uh, theory is based on the idea that markets don't. And I think this, this business of putting Hayek and Keynes head to head shows just how those two assumptions play themselves out to give you Keynesian results and Hayekian results. It's Keynes' book, though, that's called The General Theory. Isn't that amazing? The general theory. That generally, markets are hamstrung and don't work and crash anytime anything happens. <laughs> okay. I think it's Hayek's theory that's the general theory, and Keynes is a very uh, perverse case of it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll have time just for a couple of questions.